Thank you very much, Kirsty, for those incredibly kind words. They're so kind, uh, I won't deny any of that. <laughs> um, and thank you very much, everyone, for coming. I really appreciate it. <clears throat> um, as Kirsty said, I've been in Brian for some time now, and I, I know uh, I've known a lot of you uh, for that length of time. Uh, and from time to time, you have asked me this question. Why have I devoted the best part of 25 years of my research career, certainly, uh, to the study of wetlands? Well, I have to say to you, my first, um, uh, sort of the first part of the answer to that is because it comes from within. I've always enjoyed <laughs> messing around in water to the point where I actually would not let my sister into the paddling pool, as you can see. <laughs> so that's a photo, I must admit, from the 1960s, if you remember those, some of you. Um, here's the 1970s, and as you can see, uh, I did uh, expand my horizons to coastal ecosystems, at least whilst I was on holiday. And then, as Kirsty said, in the 1980s, uh, I was lucky enough to go to Loughborough University and study ecology there. And it was really, and that's me sort of front right there. Um, and, and it was there really that I thought to myself, I'm paddling around in water, which I love, and I'm identifying wild, wildlife. I could possibly make a career out of this. This is incredible. So <clears throat> I returned a bit later, 1990s, <clears throat> to Loughborough University. Uh, and there's me during my PhD years. And just looking at that uh, there, I can, uh, I can see why my dad gave me that coat, actually, given the colour uh, that it is there. I'm sure Dave won't be too impressed with that colour. Um, and then on to Brighton uh, and my work, uh, as, as Kirsty said, in, in the Baltic states in, in the 2000s. And as you can see, somewhere between Loughborough and Brighton, I had gone grey. So moving to Brighton kind of made me go grey. And then most recently... Uh, just a few years ago, this was uh, during a sabbatical, I was lucky enough to work in the United States in Indiana in this case, but you can see nothing really has changed. I'm still splashing about in wetlands and in watery places. Okay, I've put a bit more biomass on, but uh, that's, that's ecological succession for you. <laughs> Okay, so there is obviously another reason why I'm interested in wetlands. It's not just uh, the passion that I have personally that I feel for sort of watery places, but it's also because they are absolutely fascinating places. They are, as you can see from this photo here, they are, they are, they are uh, uh, lovely places. Uh, they are hugely important for humans. They're hugely important for wildlife as well. So what I would like to do uh, in this lecture is share some of that... Um, uh, the importance of wetlands to you with, a, with an introduction, first of all. That'll last about 20 minutes or so. Then I'm going to go on to talk about some research highlights. That's about another 20 minutes. And then you'll be relieved to hear, uh, when you hear about the future, that there's only 10 minutes or so to go, because that's my, that's my concluding section. OK, so we'll start with an introduction to wetlands. And the question, what is a wetland? Well, I can confirm to you after 25 years of in-depth research, that water is really important. <laughs> so, as you can see, I'm building up a model wetland on the, on the right-hand side of this slide here. Also, being serious, water is the controlling factor in, in wetlands. Water supply, water quantity, water quality, the distribution of water in wetlands is fundamentally important because it influences the type of substrate or soil, if you prefer, uh, that exists in that particular wetland environment. Some substrates are seasonally saturated, some waterlogged, some inundated, flooded, and that will affect, of course, the type of plant species, the vegetation, that can exist in the particular hydrological regime, the, the, the water conditions in, in that particular wetland. So plants have to be adapted to the particular hydrological regime in, in the particular wetland. So as you can see, I've built up our sort of model wetland there. These are the fundamental three features that shape all wetlands. But of course, there's a diversity of different wetland types, some of which you are, I'm sure that you are familiar with. So there are variations on that theme. So uh, I'm going to just sort of introduce one or two to you now, or, or a few to you. Firstly, marshes. Uh, and as you can see from the diagram on the right there here, uh, water levels are 
close to ground surface, just below ground surface, pretty much all year round. Um, and as a result of that, uh, that restricts the uh, colonization and growth of trees, and we have herbaceous or soft vegetation. Uh, and just to illustrate there, there's a, a Polish marsh landscape for you. In contrast, different type of wetlands you might have heard of, the swamps, here we have water levels above ground level all year round. And in those conditions, the plants must be emergent. They root in the, the soil or the substrate. They grow through the water column and out into the air. And here's one example on the left-hand side, a Baltic swamp habitat. <clears throat> this is club rush in the Baltic Sea. But in the United States, in North America, it's also quite common to have uh, the vegetation dominated by tree species. This is a, uh, a swamp cypress forest in um, or swamp cypress swamp, I should say, in Florida, for example. And you might think, well, they're, they're, they're very different. But of course, the, the essential features are the same, water levels above ground and a, a dominant sort of single species, as I say. In this case, it's woody rather than herbaceous. You may well have heard of bogs, possibly even fens. Collectively, they're known as mires because they are formed on peat. Uh, so that's why I've sort of shown the, the black box there in, on, in, on the, the model diagram on the right-hand side. So here we have a stable hydrology, high water levels, water logs all year round, very little fluctuation. In those conditions, there's a, a lack of oxygen. Plants partially or very slowly decompose, uh, form peat, and that accumulates. Uh, and that can stunt the growth of trees in some cases. So the, the, the image there is of an Estonian bog, as you can see, with, uh, with, with rather sort of short trees uh, growing through that. Uh, and then I'm, I've, we've all heard of floodplains and floodplain wetlands. We include those in, in our wetland science here. Um, and as you can see, again, it's a different substrate. It's alluvial material, it tends to be rather permeable and, and, and allow water through it. And of course, I, I've indicated there that, that floodplains uh, should uh, periodically flood. So water levels are very variable, much more variable. Uh, and the image on the left is uh, of, a, of a floodplain that we're typically used to seeing here in the UK and over large parts of the world. This has actually been cleared of trees at some point in the, in, in the past or maybe frequent flooded as limited tree growth. Uh, so we have quite often these open floodplain landscapes that are used for agriculture. But not always, of course, just to remind you perhaps uh, of something, uh, a floodplain forest, which is perhaps a little bit more natural. Again, this is uh, uh, back in Indiana where I was doing some work, and this is a, a flooded floodplain forest. So floodplains are rather variable there. But fundamentally, those, those water levels are fluctuating on, a, on alluvial soils. So I've introduced a variety of different uh, wetland types to you there. There's a great diversity of wetland types, but just to reiterate, they have these three sort of features in common of, of hydrology, shaping substrate, influencing vegetation. And this is how we define wetlands, but also how we understand wetlands as well. Wetlands also have in common the fact that they are hugely beneficial to people and to society. We call these ecosystem services, the sorts of products, the benefits that wetlands can bring to humans, uh, to people, to society, as I've said. And just a few examples of the great benefits that wetlands bring for you now. They have been called sponges of the landscape, uh, which means that wetlands can absorb flood water, slow its flow, and release it slowly, thereby limiting uh, potential hazardous uh, extreme flooding further downstream, a hugely beneficial uh, uh, aspect of wetland ecosystems. They have a bit of a split personality because some people have also called them kidneys of the landscape as well. Uh, and that means that they, they can act as, as, uh, as purifiers. They can cleanse and clean water. They can remove sediment. They can remove um, nutrients and they can remove pollutants, for example. So the example I've got on the right-hand side there is of a Danish constructed wetland. And that was built just downstream of a village to remove sewage from, the, from that uh, village population. They are the most productive ecosystems in the world. Swamps and, mar uh, swamps and marshes, uh, for example. Um, and humans have long harnessed, exploited, 
that natural productivity in the form of aquaculture. So the image I've got there on the right is of a, of a rice, of a series of rice fields. So three billion people depend upon the rice crop, and that is a wetland plant species. So if, you know, just to reinforce the importance of wetlands to people uh, on a global basis uh, for you there. And also many wetlands, most wetlands are exploited in terms of agriculture, so they can be grazed by cattle or cut for hay or other crops. Uh, and that uh, uh, agricultural system is in practice uh, wide, in a widespread way around the world. So there's three key sort of benefits or services that we derive from wetlands, and there are many others. I don't have time to go through all of those, but as you can see, I have listed some more examples for you there. Worth, a couple worth picking out uh, that you may well not have, have been aware of is that aspirin um, is derived from the bark of the willow tree. And uh, willow is, of course, a wetland plant species. And at the bottom there, the bottom bullet point, is, uh, shows you um, salt. And uh, most of the world's salt production comes from wetlands, from salt lagoons and salt pans. So all of these products, all of these great benefits are derived from wetlands. They're hugely important. Underpinning those wetland services is biological diversity. So biological diversity is a supporting service in itself. There's plenty of evidence to, to, to show that the more diverse wetlands operate more efficiently and more effectively and give us more benefits. So just one example there. The main picture shows uh, a diverse wetland vegetation in some close-up. And there's a variety of different species there of different structural forms, sizes and shapes. Under the soil there, there'll be roots, uh, formation, some longer, some shorter, some acting as a, as a mesh. So this biological diversity actually improves, for example, the sponge function that I've already spoken about. Biological diversity then is, is hugely important, but it's not just important in terms of those maybe less tangible benefits that we can't necessarily see, but it's also important, of course, because it's wildlife. And we like to visit wetlands because we can see a range of wildlife. Uh, the top picture there, for, is, is of a red shank, a wading bird, and uh, many people visit wetlands to go bird watching, for example, but let's not forget the other aspects of biodiversity within wetlands, invertebrates such as the marsh fritillary butterfly, mammals, and that's a picture of an elk that we happen to see in uh, one of our research projects in Estonia. So biological diversity is something that I have, uh, have a great interest in within wetlands as well. The particular focus for my research over the years, uh, as Kirsty mentioned, has been wet grasslands. So to start with my model diagram there for you, just to show you that these are wetlands just as much as any other sort of wetland formation. In this case, you can see that they are prone to flooding, wet grasslands. And whilst they have uh, an abundance of grasses, as the name suggests, I've got a plus there after grasses as you can see there. And that's because, whilst grasses tend to be abundant in the, this wetland type, there's a whole range of, of other species that are associated with them as well. Loads and loads of wildflowers. They are amongst the most species rich, the most diverse wetland types uh, anywhere on the planet. So my diagram there is sort of reflecting uh, some of these aspects. But they are special. I think they're rather the unique. So whilst all wetlands are exploited by humans for this productivity, um, wet grasslands have a deep-seated, very intimate, close, long-term relationship with humans. Because they're created often, there's a parachuting cow for you, um, they're created often by, by human management and they are certainly maintained by human management in the form of grazing by cattle, See when the floods have receded, cutting for hay or for other forage and fed to cattle, and then some are actually partially drained so that agricultural activity of this type can take place. So it's interested me that they have this very close relationship with humans, maintaining their distinctive, their particular open landscape characteristic and the biological diversity that is supported within that particular uh, landscape. So just to uh, reiterate some of these key points about wet grasslands, because I'm going to talk about my res research shortly in a little more detail. Typically, they're found on floodplains, along coasts, uh, and by lakes. 
Uh, you may have heard of the term of, of meadows or wet meadows or hay meadows. Those are wet grasslands that, where the, the main type of management is cutting for hay. You may have heard of pastures, and those are wet grasslands or other grasslands where grazing is the dominant management type. But we include those in our wet grass and wetland types. And as the third bullet point says there, uh, many are considered <coughs> semi-natural because they've been created, they're maintained by this human activity, but they're hugely important cultural landscapes within the sort of rural environment. They have often been managed for centuries, if not thousands of years, with a low intensity management level. And that means, as you can see from this uh, example here, just a few cattle per hectare grazing, reasonably low intensity, or maybe one or two cuts for hay a year. No agri-chemicals like herbicides or fertilizers are paid, uh, applied. And this is a traditional farming system. Uh, has been carried out for, uh, for centuries, as I said, in many parts of the world. So they are amongst the most biologically diverse wetland types. They support those ecosystem services I've already introduced to you. But they are endangered by management changes because, of course, traditional farming system uh, you know, really has becoming somewhat obsolete. Maybe it's no longer viable. It's been replaced by a much more modern, intensive farming system in many parts of the world. And then there's the opposite case where management has been withdrawn or abandoned uh, completely. The ecological implications of those management changes really have been my focus. So I've tried to capture what I've been doing over the last 20 plus years in the, in the realm of wet grasslands with this question. I'm very really interested in how best to manage, uh, how can we possibly restore wet grasslands for biodiversity, which underpins these benefits that wetlands give us in this changing sort of agricultural environmental context that we, uh, that we, we are in. So, as you can see, I'm moving on to my research highlights now. One of the first questions that I set myself was really then what happens to this wet grassland, wet grassland systems that have been maintained under a low intensity system when modern intensive agricultural activity takes place. And in particular, the key indicator, which is the application of fertilizers. I wanted to find out how sensitive are wet grasslands to fertilizer application as an indicator of intensification. In order to do that, I needed to find a very species-rich wet grassland. And I found that in the Czech Republic, the Luznica floodplain, as you can see from this picture here. A wonderful landscape, a natural flood pulse hydrology, cut once or two, twice a year. Archive records suggest for a 1,000 years. Hugely species-rich as a result of that low-intensity management. This is a a shot of about a square meter or so. There are over 30 plant species packed into that square meter there. Only a fool would add fertilizers to that vegetation. <laughs> well, hello. <laughs> it was for, in the name of science, I can assure you. Um, so I did. I applied fertilizers to find out just how sensitive this wet grassland system was and the diversity was uh, to the impacts of modern fertilizers or fertilizer application. So just to uh, illustrate here, I had a control area where no fertilizers were applied. That's the ongoing vegetation. I applied 300 kilos of nitrogen per hectare a year, and that is the average amount used in agricultural systems in Europe. So it's just an average of modern intensive agriculture. And then I also applied 600 kilos, and that is really a maximum amount used under intensive grazing systems in the Netherlands, in East Anglia, and so on. Um, so those were you know, real world values, but they are fairly extreme, I suppose, in that case. And as you can see, I applied the fertilizers, continued cutting over two seasons. And this uh, axis here shows the numbers of species. Control plots continue to show uh, high species richness, as you'd expect through this ongoing management with no fertilizers. But at 600 kilos of nitrogen applied to that system, there was a significant loss of species within seven weeks. So just to highlight the sensitivity here, uh, 
this grassland system that had formed over thousands of years lost a significant number of species in just seven weeks using a modern agricultural system. Uh, under sort of 300 kilos, the average amount used in agriculture these days, uh, there's a significant decline within 13 weeks. By the end of the two seasons of the experiment, uh, there was a, a loss of more than 50% in the higher levels of fertilizer application. And there was a loss of more than a third under the average levels of fertilizer application. So that's one deviation from that low intensity management, much more intensive. The other aspect is, of course, what happens when management is no longer continued, the impacts of abandonment. Uh, and you might think this isn't necessarily such an issue as modern intensive agriculture, but, but I can assure you it is in many parts of the world. Due to socioeconomic changes, um, due to political changes, uh, there are large uh, areas of the world where agricultural abandonment is really quite commonplace. And wetlands being somewhat difficult to manage sometimes, being a bit marginal, they're often you know, in the front line in terms of being abandoned. So it's an issue, for example, in the USA, in North America, and particularly in Central and Eastern Europe. So I headed off with a bunch of colleagues to Estonia to explore the issue of abandonment. And again, really asking the question, how sensitive are these wet grassland systems to a lack of management? It could be considered that um, a return to a more natural wetland might be beneficial, but then we may well lose this characteristic biological diversity of the low-intensity managed system. So I needed to find that out. We studied this uh, for six years in, in, in Estonia, and I've also done uh, reviews of other people's work, and I've got some summary results for you here. Oh, I ought to say, this is a, a low-intensity managed uh, wet grassland in Estonia that abuts the, uh, the Baltic Sea there. You can see uh, good diversity here, just a few trees and shrubs coming in, but there's a few cattle that graze that every year and maintain this open landscape, which is superb for wading birds. So these are the uh, summary key points of the, of the work that we did on abandonment in, in Estonia, myself and my colleagues. Within three years, we could identify changes in the existing vegetation, three years of abandonment. Within three years, species were eliminated. So we're beginning to see a loss of diversity. Within four years, or after four years, grass biomass could increase by 300%. And obviously that was having effect on the rest of the vegetation. It was shading species of smaller stature and those are often the rare species. Six years seedling viability was reduced because seeds could no longer grow through the dense litter and the, and the, and the sort of dense robust grasses that dominated. And then no surprise that there was invasion by shrubs and trees. But that was very variable, it depended. It could happen in five years, it could happen in 40. And that was quite an interesting result that we found as well. So just to complete that picture for you, this is an Estonian wet grassland that's been abandoned for about 20 years. And as you can see, the landscape character has completely changed. Uh, invasion by pine uh, and sort of robust swamp vegetation actually coming in from the Baltic Sea. So a loss of diversity, or the characteristic biodiversity there. So, of course, my mind then turned to, is it possible to restore, to recover former glories in these, in this, in these wet grassland systems? Uh, firstly, through vegetation management. So reinstating appropriate management, in our case cutting, to the, some of these Estonian wet grasslands in an experimental way to find out whether it is possible to restore these wet grasslands. And uh, we continued our studies in Estonia to do that. And what I actually want to do now <clears throat> is show you a short film clip. Uh, it was made by the European Union uh, and it's partly about our project work. Um, we spent six years doing this work, as I said, and it was funded by Darwin Initiative Earthwatch, uh, as Kirsty said, using a whole group of, uh, of myself, colleagues here at Brighton University, colleagues in Estonia, and volunteers from around the world. So you'll see some of those uh, now. And what I wanted to sh why I wanted to show you this is because Estonia is a wonderful wetland landscape, and I just wanted you to get a flavour of what it's like to be out there. The only thing that's missing, as Kirsty said, is the mosquitoes. 
So if you could, whilst watching this, make a high-pitched whining or buzzing noise, that would be very much appreciated. You will get the full, uh, full flavour of Estonia. Okay, so bear with me. Here are some results from the experiment that you saw being, uh, being implemented there in the field in Estonia. Um, so just to remind you then, we reinstated cutting management, in this case to a coastal wet grassland that had been abandoned for 15 years. This diagram here is, is um, the points on this diagram represent so points on this diagram represent plant community composition, the vegetation type, at one particular location within that experimental setup at one particular point in time. And we basically monitored the vegetation in abandoned plots compared to cut plots over five years. This diagram, the way that this, this uh, classification or, or this uh, ordination works, is that the points that plot most closely together have a very similar plant community composition. And the points that are a long way apart have very few species, if any, in common at all. So we can look at how vegetation changes in relation to abandonment and then in a, in a bit in terms of cutting. And as you can see, no surprise, in, in as much as vegetation just does change over time across the five years in this sort of direction, these points are moving across this diagram, indicating vegetation change with abandonment. But in terms of the cut plots, you can see that it was even greater change. So the cutting seemed to initiate even more vegetation change. And over time, the vegetation changed further away, became more dissimilar to the abandoned plots. So our conclusion from that experiment is that it is possible to reinstate cutting management and be successful in achieving some sort of restoration. It may take quite a few years, but it can be, it can be done. Of course, the other aspect of restoration for many wetlands is that they have been, as I've suggested, partially drained in the past. And we had an opportunity, I had an opportunity with, with, uh, with colleagues, to investigate the possibility uh, uh, or investigate the effects of raising water levels on previously partially drained wetlands. This time, rather than uh, anywhere slightly exotic, uh, on the Pevensey levels uh, in Sussex. Uh, near Eastbourne, for those of you who know, just a little along the coast. Um, but it's a, a hugely important wetland landscape. It's of global significance, but it has, as I say, been partially drained. And you can see from this picture here that the ditch, the water levels in the ditches are really, or were really, quite a long way below the field level. But in the 1980s and the 1990s, the government funded a scheme whereby farmers could volunteer, or landowners, volunteer to enter the scheme and would be funded to raise water levels on the Pevensey levels in their fields in order to try to restore wetlands and encourage or improve the conditions for nature conservation. So we studied 23 of those fields that were entered into this restoration scheme over 20 years. And, and uh, we were able to survey, as I say, 23 fields to do that. So the effects of raising water levels here. I've got a diagram that summarizes our, our results of this particular study. Um, this is a classification diagram. And again, it's based on plant community composition, the vegetation growing in each of these fields. So at the bottom here, yeah, these are all our different fields that we surveyed. Uh, those that are in the same end groups, as they're called, the same clusters at the bottom, have very similar vegetation composition, pretty much the same. They cannot be separated on this divisive classification diagram. So they're all pretty much the same. The first division, therefore, is the most important. It separates out that group of fields from those. And we found that that division was based on a flooding threshold. So where farmers, landowners had raised their water levels substantially to above that threshold of more than five months of winter flooding, extending into the growing season, and relatively deep flood water, then wetland plants would very rapidly colonize. 
within a couple of years, in fact. Over the other side of the diagram, those areas continue to be uh, relatively terrestrial dry grassland areas. So uh, perhaps an even more significant result, really, is what we found that the time since raised water levels really didn't have uh, an impact in terms of creating wetland vegetation. So some farmers had raised water levels very slightly, but maybe as many as 20 years ago. And w dry grassland areas persisted in those areas. But some farmers and some landowners had entered the scheme just two years before. They'd raised water levels substantially above that threshold, and they found wetlands with wetland plant species encouraging wading birds back in were being created. Okay, so that's a sort of resume of some of the past um, uh, research. You can tell now that I'm moving towards the last uh, 10, 15 minutes or so. Um, and it, it's really looking at sort of present and future prospects for wetlands. And I'm sure you will not be surprised to read that climate change is the sort of the most pressing threat that we probably face now in terms of, uh, of, of our wetland future. Um, I've looked at global climate change predictions uh, and I've drawn out some of the key trends for wetlands that pertain, as I say, to wetlands between now uh, and the end of the century. And they indicate sort of four main, main trends. Firstly, uh, an increase in temperature, the warming scenario. Secondly, there will be changes in, in, in precipitation, and that will obviously affect water availability in wetlands. Thirdly, there's sea level rise. That will clearly impact coastal wetlands. And then fourthly, there is predicted to be an increase in the frequency and magnitude of extreme climate events, such as heat waves, storms, droughts, and floods. And I'm sure you're aware of those sorts of uh, phenomena reported in the news. And it's that fourth one that my current research and my colleagues' current research focuses on. I'm really interested in the ecological implications of those sorts of climate change predictions. And I've, knowing what we do now about wetlands, they are driven, controlled by their hydrology. I, I, I start with hydrology, water characteristics, and how those will be impacted by those sorts of climate change trends. Firstly, of course, warming will lead to drying wetlands. There's already plenty of evidence to suggest that wetlands are drying in the Mediterranean, in parts of China, for example. Secondly, sea level rise storms will obviously impact coastal wetlands. Um, and there's the possibility, there's the likelihood of saline intrusion from seawater into freshwater wetlands that are um, situated close to the coast. And then, of course, intense, intense rainfall uh, is generating extreme flooding, already been recorded in the USA, in Central Europe, um, and obviously some parts of the UK fairly recently. Um, and the sort of picture I'm painting there is one of much greater hydrological variability, much greater instability in terms of the environmental conditions that, that shape our wetland environments. And as you know, plants are adapted to that hydro hydrological character. And so we can expect to see the vegetation changing in our wetlands in the future. Ruderal, which are weedy species, that are fast growing, that set seeds rapidly, complete their life, or sets many seeds and complete their life cycles rapidly, are likely to be most responsive. Maybe our future wetlands will look a little bit like that in terms of their surface. But also invasive, non-native species that can degrade and damage our, our native flora and fauna, they are likely to be facilitated by droughts, floods, and by these warming trends. And let's not forget, of course, there are some really quite serious potential human implications. Livelihoods, because we've seen how important the services wetlands are, uh, services that wetlands provide are to humans, livelihoods and income are likely to be threatened. That's partly because there's likely to be a much less reliable production. There's much less certainty about being able to manage wetlands for a reliable crop. This could lead to an increase in abandonment, and we've already seen the potential ecological degradation 
that results from abandonment. And then the fourth bullet point there is that there are likely to be negative interaction with other human pressures. So we already, as humans, extract people, extract uh, water from wetlands, but in drought conditions, we're likely to need more. But of course, wetlands need water too. So current research is focusing on extreme climate events and in particular, extreme flood events. And for this research, we have used uh, a field site at Amberley, which is in West Sussex. Uh, and we also have uh, a wetland experimental research facility. And I've sort of shown you that facility in that uh, inset picture down there. This is Amberley, by the way, in, in flood conditions, just to sort of indicate that. But that's our wetland experimental research fa facility. Rather a grand title for an enclosure at Moorscombe campus where we grow plants in buckets. <laughs> but <laughs> the key point is we are able to manipulate water levels very accurately within those buckets. So I've got one final graph for you showing some of our very recent uh, research results. This particular experiment, um, we were very interested in trying to find out whether some plant species are more resilient to this extreme flood scenarios um, than other species. And possibly, therefore, we could use that knowledge to create and design more resilient wetlands in the future. So what we have here is we have grown in these pots uh, two, oh, sorry, two, uh, species that I've highlighted with blue dots here that are highly characteristic of very wet wetland environments. They're sort of fully wetland species there. And then these green ones are uh, species that we find, plant species that we find in more terrestrial, drier grassland areas. And obviously our, our hypothesis is the wetland species will be more resilient to extreme flood events than the grassland dry species. Uh, and this particular graph shows um, the response in terms of their flowering time, the time of the year in which they flower, with uh, naught being represented by January the 1st, as you can see uh, the Julian days listed there. So we have three treatments. We have a control. Those are unflooded conditions. There's no flooding. We have two-day floods. So we had a period of two days flooding, a short period of a few of some days without flooding, and then repeated two-day flooding through the growing season. And then our mo most extreme flood scenario was seven-day floods repeated through the growing season there. And you can see this species here, which is cuckoo flower, Cardamine pretensis, cuckoo flower. This main sort of dot here represents the day in which 50% of the plants in our experiment were actually in flower. The, the lines represent 25% and then 75%. But really we're interested, well, I'm showing you here and, and, and concentrating on when 50% of plants were in flower. So it's a spring flowering species under control conditions. Under two day flood scenario, that flooding, that sort of that flowering was delayed by a week, but under the seven day most extreme flood scenario, the fl flowering was delayed by a whole month. That might not seem like too serious an impact necessarily, but of course there are a whole range of invertebrates like butterflies that feed on these species at this time of year. It's a critical time of year for many invertebrates and other aspects of biodiversity. So a month delay, could be really rather have serious implications. In contrast, one of the terrestrial uh, gra dry grassland species, hawkbit, actually advanced its flowering, but it flowers in autumn. And then it's arguable, I think, that the most resilient species was this uh, juncus, this rush species, because uh, it showed no change in terms of its flowering period, even under the seven day flooding. So we can conclude that some species do show resilience to flooding, uh, to extreme flooding, the sorts of extreme flooding scenarios that are predicted in the future. And we can use that information to create, design more resilient wetlands that could potentially help mitigate some of these climate change impacts in the future. So 
some conclusions, bringing some of those multiple points together. Wetlands are special ecosystems. I hope I've demonstrated that to you if you didn't actually um, consider that already. And they do provide vital benefits to society. And humans can exploit wetlands sustainably. My work on wet grasslands has shown that. But it's also shown that intensive management or abandonment can really rather rapidly lead to ecological degradation. But wetlands can be restored through appropriate hydrological and or vegetation management. Again, I've, I've shown some slides to, uh, to support that claim. Climate change does represent an emerging challenge, but I think I can leave you on a positive note, because I can say that there is an opportunity to create more resilient wetlands, and our current research at Brighton is showing that, and that could help mitigate climate impacts. So I'd just like to thank you uh, once again for coming this evening, and I'd also like to thank these people uh, in addition. Um, this is just a selection of the many people that have inspired me uh, and supported me over my research career. Uh, I'm absolutely delighted that Professor Max Wade is here. Max is the, uh, he's at the top of the list there, um, by happy coincidence. Um, Max is the president-elect for the Chartered Institute of Ecology and Environmental Management, and he's going to close this event for us now.